Hey, a few months, about last November, however many months ago that's been, seven, eight months, Starla and I released uh, our book called Better Marriage Against All Odds. And we've had fun with this, sharing in other places, uh, television interview and uh, getting a chance to talk to people one-on-one. In fact, we even met a couple in the last service uh, who was here, just saw our interview on Daystar and uh, came today just because of that interview. Uh, we've had fun with it. But, you know, it, it took a lot for us to get to this place. Starla says it took us 11 years to like each other enough to write this. That's what you said, right? Yeah. Uh, by the time 11 years into our recovery in our marriage uh, to actually write it, then when we got away and wrote it, we wrote it in about 11 days. Uh, here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to share just some thoughts out of chapter 19. Y'all all know what chapter 19 is, right? Yeah, yeah I'm kidding. Uh, it's called Embrace the Shame. And it's one of the chapters that I wrote. In this book, Starla wrote the first 10 chapters. I wrote the next 10, and then we wrote five together. Uh, this is called Embrace the Shame. And although it's not really written for me to teach from, uh, I, I do state that here's what Embrace the Shame really means. It means that you don't have to live in the shame. Uh, that embracing the shame recognizes the reality of the past in order to free someone from his or her future. And embracing the shame allows you to not hide from the past, but ri rather thrive in spite of the past. Can somebody say amen? Uh, there are several things that are in here that are really good. As I'm rereading, I'm thinking, wow, that's good. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But here's where the whole thought came from. Just a, a few days into our storm, when a storm hit our marriage, and you know you can read about it in the book, it was the worst moments of our life, my life, uh, and we're trying to figure out if we can stay together, if we can weather this storm, if we can make it through. And I have a guy, a friend, who calls me, and he's talking, and I don't remember anything else he said other than he said, "Kendall, embrace the shame, brother. Embrace the shame." I thought that sounds stupid. I just, you know, somebody else had told me, say, hey, don't talk about what you don't want people to remember. I thought, that sounds better. Let's go with that. Let's not talk about our worst moments. Let's not talk about, you know, our ugliest time in life. Let's don't talk about that. Just don't talk about what you don't want people to remember. That sounded better to me. But there was something, as I began to really soak in what he was saying, there was something that I realized that when I really did learn how to embrace the shame, I learned, I didn't have to live in the shame the rest of my life. That's not my choice, to live in that shame. I'm, I can embrace it, but what I found is in the same way that when you confess sin, you disempower it over your life. When you confess sin, you are freed from it. When I embrace shame, I learned to disempower that shame over my life. I learned to live and thrive in spite of the past. So there's a few things that I just want to say to you about shame today. Who didn't get this book? Huh? There's always, yeah. Huh? Okay. You didn't come here. Come here. I'm gonna give it to you. You're the only one honest enough to raise your hand because there's about another 200 people that didn't buy it either. They just didn't want to, they didn't want to admit it here. I want you to have that. God bless you. I love you. All right. Uh, to kind of bring this in perspective, how many remember, uh, remember Johnny Cash? Everybody, okay. Anybody remember the song he sang, A Boy Named Sue? Yeah. Okay, how many of you honestly don't have a clue? All right, more of you that don't have a clue. So for those of you that don't have a clue, I'm going to read the words to this epic hymn of the church. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. Uh, here's what it says. This is Johnny Cash. Remember the man in black. My daddy left home when I was three and he didn't leave much to my ma and me. Just this old guitar and an empty bottle of booze. Now I don't blame him because he run and hid. But the meanest thing he ever did was before he left, he went and named me Sue. Well, he must have thought it was quite a joke and it got lots of laughs from lots of folk. Seemed I had to fight my whole life through. Some gal would giggle and I'd get red. Some guy would laugh and I'd bust his head. I tell you, life ain't easy for a boy named Sue. Well, I grew up quick and I grew up mean. My fist got hard and my wits got keen. keen. I'd roam from town to town to hide my shame. But I made a vow to the moon and stars that I'd search the honky-tonks and bars and I'd kill that man that gave me that awful name. 
Well, it was in Gatlinburg in mid-July, and I just hit town, and my throat was dry, and I thought I'd stop and have myself a brew. At an old saloon on a street of mud, there at a table dealing studs sat the dirty, mangy dog that named me Sue. Well, I knew that snake was my own sweet dad from a worn-out picture that my mother had and the scar on his cheek and his evil eye. He was big and bent, gray and old, and I looked at him. My blood ran cold, and I said, my name is Sue. How do you do? Now you're going to die. Great way to greet your dad, huh? Well, I hit him hard right between the eyes, and he went down, but to, but to my surprise, he came up with a knife and cut off a piece of my ear. <laughs> Evander Holyfield knows what that's like. Um, but I busted a chair right across his teeth, and we crashed through the wall and in the street, kicking and gouging in the mud and the blood and the beer. I tell you, I fought tougher men, but I really can't remember when. He kicked like a mule, and he bit like a crocodile. I heard him laugh, and then I heard him cuss, and he went for his gun. I pulled mine first. He stood there looking at me, and I saw him smile. He said, son, this world is rough, and if a man's going to make it, he's got to be tough. And I knew I wouldn't be there to help you along, so I give you that name. And I said goodbye, and I knew you'd have to get tough or die, and that's the name that helped make you strong. And he said, now, you just fought one heck of a fight, and I know you hate me, and you got the right to kill me now, and I wouldn't blame you if you do. But you ought to thank me before I die for the gravel in your guts and the spit in your eye, because I'm the son of a gun that named you Sue. Last verse. I got all choked up. I threw down my gun and I called him Pa and he called me son. And I came away with a different point of view. And I think about him now and then every time I try and every time I win. And if I ever have a son, I think I'm going to name him Bill or George. <laughs> Anything but Sue. I still hate that name. <laughs> Johnny Cash, a boy named Sue. The whole message of this story song is about how he had to live with the shame of that name but then of course in the end he uh, found out why his dad really named him that it was for a good cause but he still wasn't going to name his boy Sue now here's the deal we all suffer shame of some kind every single one of us some of your shame may have come from others it may have been inflicted upon you by others some of your shame may be self-inflicted, something that you've done yourself. Some of our, our, our shame may come from bad choices, bad attitudes, bad feelings, bad relationships. But we all deal with shame of some kind. It could have been when you were in junior high and you stood up to give a book report in front of the class and all of a sudden you bombed, they laughed, you've never forgotten about it. You will get over it. You will get over it. Maybe you... Uh, failed an exam or you failed a class or you failed a grade or you dropped out of school. Maybe you're still dealing with shame. Maybe you invested money and you lost it all. Maybe you married someone and it didn't work out. Maybe you attempted to start a business and it failed or you made some poor choices as a parent. You feel guilty about the impact upon your kids. Maybe someone called you names that are still ringing in your head today or somebody embarrassed you or somebody singled you out or somebody took advantage of you and, and abused you emotionally or physically or even sexually and you still deal with that shame. Maybe somebody made you do things that you're ashamed of, things that you were subjected to that no person should ever be subjected to. The fact is we all deal with shame of some kind. Whether it's known or whether it's unknown, whether it's public or whether it's private, we're dealing with some type of shame. And if you don't deal with it properly, it'll hold you back. It will hinder you. It will suffocate you. Viktor Frankl said this, there's no need to be ashamed of tears for the tears bear witness that a man has the greatest courage, the courage to suffer. Your shame may have brought you to tears many times, but those tears are not something to be ashamed of. It shows that you have courage to suffer. Now, just before we read John 21, there's a, there's a pretext to this story. Most of you know the name of Peter, one of the apostles, one of the disciples of Christ. Peter is the one who, when Jesus at the Last Supper tells his disciples, one of you are going to betray me, he says, no way. Nobody's going to do that. And he looks at Peter and says, yeah, you're actually going to deny me three times before this night is through. There is no way I would do that. He was so adamant. 
But that's exactly what happened because after Jesus was arrested in the garden of Gethsemane, they t- took him to Pilate. And as he is uh, being tried in the kangaroo court, Peter ends up doing exactly what Jesus said and denies him three times. His people says, hey, you're one of his followers. No, no, I'm not one of his. Somebody else says, yeah, I, I saw you with him. No, 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 it wasn't me. Somebody else says, yeah, your, your accent gives you away. No way. And he starts cussing and saying, no, I didn't do it. I'm not one of them. You've got me mistaken for somebody else. And then he hears the rooster crow. And he remembers what Jesus said. That when you hear that rooster crow, you're going to know you've denied me three times. Well, Jesus ends up, I mean, uh, Peter ends up quitting the ministry, ends up going back to fishing. Now, Jesus appears to his disciples a few times after he is raised from the dead. And this is one of those times. In fact, look, John 21, look at verse number one. It says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, two other disciples were together. And here's what Simon says. He says, I'm going to fish. I'm going out fishing. They said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? And they said, no, mind your own business. They didn't say it, but that's what they were thinking. He said, throw your nets on the other side and you'll find some. Can you imagine what these fishermen are thinking? Who's the expert on the shore over there? But they did what he said and they caught a large number of fish. Verse 7 says, then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say that, It is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off. He jumped into the water and he made a beeline straight to the shore heading towards Jesus. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there with the fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Notice this part here. Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Well, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter kind of looked at him funny. Well, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. A little time passes and Peter, or Jesus looks at Peter and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Now this moment in Peter's life, this was Peter's restoration moment. Whenever he was restored back to right relationship with Jesus. Because the last time he had any meaningful contact with Jesus was whenever he had denied Christ and Christ was being taken away to be crucified and Jesus turned and the scripture says looked at Peter looked at him and the eyes of Jesus just pierced the soul of Peter I can remember and of course this doesn't even begin to compare to the look of Jesus to Peter but I spent every summer living with my grandfather and three months out of every year I was down working on his farm, living with him, my brothers and I. There was a pond on his farm that when the rain would really come in hard, he had built a spillway. And if you understand what a spillway is, it's just a way to be able to navigate the overflow water around the bank, the levee of the pond to keep things from washing out so that it would come around and reconnect with the creek. And he always told us, stay off of the spillway because he didn't want us tearing up the sod because if 
the sod was torn up, then the water would wash out the spillway. So he wanted to keep us off of it. There was only one problem. Whenever the rains came in really hard and the pond would overflow and water would wash around that spillway, so would the fish in the crawdads. <laughs> and my brothers and I were down there and I was simply just following my older brother's example. And we were down there and there were fish flopping around on the spillway. And it's like, surely it would be all right if we just go out there and grab the fish and the crawdads and we make our way back. He'll never know. <laughs> So we run out there and I, and I remember getting down and catching these fish. They're flopping around and crawdads and we're grabbing them. This is just, I mean, it's a time of our life. You would fish for those suckers in that pond for hours and hardly ever catch them. And here they are just laying here for us and we're grabbing them. All of a sudden I can feel eyes beaming through the back of my head. And I look back up towards the barn and there over that wooden fence is my grandfather just looking over and he just shakes his head and turns and walks off. And I'm thinking, no, just come and beat me. Don't shake your head and walk away. I'd rather you beat me and hurt me. Don't, don't just look disappointed. You know that feeling when somebody just so disappointed. Man, I felt so bad. I felt even worse after he did beat me. But... <laughs> He, he believed in that scripture, spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, but I can just imagine the look of Jesus as he looked at Peter and pierced his soul with that look of broken hardness. Well, this is the moment when Peter is being restored to Jesus. Jesus comes to him and, and there's a few things that happen. In fact, when you run towards shame, when you run towards it, you embrace it. You embrace the shame of whether it's injuries caused by others, injuries caused by yourself. You break its power over your life when you run towards it. Now, let me give you here three things real quick. Three things that happen when you embrace your shame. Number one, you break the power of the past. See, some of you are living in the shame of the past and the power of the past have been holding you back for way too long. Whenever you embrace your shame, you refuse to de be defined by your failures. You refuse to be suffocated by that ugliness of the past. When you embrace the shame, you disempower it over your life. So you break the power of the past. But you have to be willing to run towards it. What did Peter do whenever he saw Jesus? He could have hidden shame. But no, he ran straight towards Jesus who was the object of his shame, the subject of his shame. But he ran straight towards Jesus for that moment of restoration. You're going to have to be willing to face your fears. You're going to have to be able to deal with your devils if you want to disempower the stronghold of shame in your past. In fact, there are two things that happened this last Thursday night that I thought were really cool. I was able to attend the Adaptive Training Foundation graduation. David Vabora's foundation that he has for injured veteran athletes. And we sponsored the Jason R. Wine uh, Scholarship this last year, who was a member of the Adaptive Training Foundation, was a sergeant who was dealing with Parkinson's and was here on a Sunday night when he gave his life to Jesus and just two days later was killed in a car accident. So in honor of Jason, Sergeant Jason R. Wine, we sponsored uh, the Jason R. Wine Scholarship. And the first recipient was a man by the name of Mike Moss. Mike was a veteran who's dealing with Parkinson's as well. Was having a hard time even just getting up and getting down and could hardly walk. Well, we sponsored him and he just graduated from this last class at the Adaptive Training Foundation. The graduation was Thursday night. I went to be there to celebrate with Mike and to meet him for the first time. And there were two things. There were two athletes that said something that I thought was so interesting. Just before I tell you what Mike said, there was a a veteran by the name of Candace, who is a, uh, has a prosthetic leg on her right leg, and she stood up when she received her diploma for graduating. She said, I lost my leg July 4th a year ago in a UTV accident on a sand dune. She said, this past July 4th, with my prosthetic leg, she said, I went back and got in that UTV and got right back on that sand. 
She overcame the very thing that took her leg, but she wasn't going to let that thing cause her to live in fear and be in bondage or in shame of an accident that happened. She overcame it. I thought, oh, that's good. She just faced it. She ran right into it head on. And then when Mike Moss, our recipient of the Jason Arwen Scholarship, got up, he, they said something. They started talking about as they were working out. They tried to avoid, you know, when you have Parkinson's, your hands shake a lot. And they tried to avoid it and work around the shaking. And they said every time they did, the tremors got worse. But when they would push through the tremors, they would cease. They would subside. And so they learned that in working out, not to try to avoid it, but just to press right on through it, and it made the tremors less. I thought, oh, that's good. I'm sitting here thinking, that's going to work this Sunday. Just somebody else, tell me something else. You know, I was listening to these athletes. I said, that's going to preach my sermon itself. Because there's so many of us that we live in fear of the shame of the past. We live in bondage to the past. When you face it head on, you learn to embrace it. You can disempower it from holding you back. Somebody ought to say amen. Here's the second thing that happens. You recognize the power of your present. Whenever you embrace your shame, you recognize the power of your present. Here's what I mean by that. When Jesus came to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Sure I do. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, yes. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes. Why? He wanted Peter to do something for somebody else. And here's what happens when you embrace your shame. You, you allow somebody else to be able to be freed, to be able to be liberated, to be able to uh, rise above their stronghold because of your testimony. You see, when Starla and I chose to embrace our shame, and write our story, and tell about our hurts, and tell about our failures, and tell about our mistakes. We chose to do that for other people. This wasn't about us. That's something I don't really want to talk about, but if I can help somebody else, then I will, and that's what embracing the shame has meant for us. When you embrace the shame, you recognize the power of your present to be able to help somebody else through the same thing that you have gone through, and then here's the third thing, and I'll stop. You release the power of your future. You break the power of the past. Quit living there. You recognize the power of your present where you can help somebody else. But then you release the power of your future. God has something so awesome in store for every single one of us. But if we keep living in bondage to our shame, you'll never be released into your future. You'll never be released into the potential that God has for you. Let me tell you a story about Rebecca Thompson. But Rebecca Thompson fell from the Fremont Canyon Bridge twice. She died both times. The first fall broke her heart, and the second fall broke her neck. See, Rebecca Thompson was abducted by two punks at a store outside of Casper, Wyoming. And she and her younger sister, who was only 11 years old, Amy, and Rebecca, who was 18, were abducted and were taken 45 miles southwest to the Fremont Canyon Bridge, a still structured bridge, one lane bridge, towering 112 feet above the North Platte River. And Rebecca was brutally beaten and raped. And somehow or another, she was able to talk them out of touching her little sister. But they threw both of them over that canyon bridge into the gorge. And the 11 year old Amy died instantly as she landed upon a rock. Rebecca hit the, a cliff and ricocheted into the deep waters. Her hip was fractured in five places, but somehow she struggled through the pain and the injuries and managed to get to the shore. To protect herself from the cold, she hid in between rocks until dawn came. But dawn never came. The sun never came up on the torment of her life. Oh, they they found her and the physicians tended to her wounds and the courts imprisoned her abductors. But the dawn never came on the darkness of her life, the darkness of her night. That's why 19 years later, 
she drove back to that Fremont Canyon bridge with her boyfriend and her two-year-old daughter. And she sat on the edge of that bridge and through tears, she recounted the horrible nightmare of that day. Her boyfriend didn't want to didn't want the little girl to see her mother cry. So he walked the little toddler back to the car. And that's when he heard her body hit the water. She plunged to her death a second time. What was it that caused so much hopelessness? Was it fear? Well, there certainly was a lot of fear because she testified against her abductors in court and one of them taunted her with a smirk on his face running his finger across his neck and the day that she drove back to that canyon bridge 19 years after that horrible brutal beating and rape her abductors came up for parole fear yeah there was fear anger yeah there was a lot of anger she was angry she was angry at her Rapist. She was angry at the parole board. She was angry at God. She was angry at herself. There was a lot of anger. But shame is probably her greatest enemy. There was fear. There was anger. There was even guilt. Guilt because she lived and her sister didn't. But shame was the greatest because every one of her friends knew the details of that horrible account. And thousands and thousands of people that she didn't even know. As her story was printed in newspapers and continued to spread across the internet, her, her shame was so great that she couldn't get above it. She couldn't rise above it. She couldn't break from underneath it. Here's what I want you to realize. Some of your shame may be so private that nobody else knows but you, but it can still hold you captive if you're not careful. It can still make you a prisoner to the past. Some of your shame may be public. It may be in a book that everybody can read. It may be something that everybody knows. But regardless of whether your shame is private or whether your shame is public, if you don't deal with it and if you don't embrace it, you will never disempower it. It will always have a hold over your life. And here's what I want to say to you today, Freedom. There's no shame in embracing your shame. When you embrace it, you disempower it, you take its hold off of your life so that you can live free from that shame, free from the past, free from the mistakes, so you can be everything that God intends for you to be. And I'm calling you out of that closet of shame. I'm calling you out of that canyon of disappointment. I'm calling you out of that so you can live above it and you can be the man and the woman of God that God intends for you to be. God doesn't want you to live in that hurt and that pain and that torment anymore. It's been a nightmare long enough. It's time for you to wake up. It's time for you to come out of that darkness. It's time for you to let the light of Jesus Christ shine inside of your heart and heal you and restore you. And you say, how can I do that? Just run back to the arms of Jesus. Run back to the arms of Jesus and let him speak into your ear. I love you. I'm proud of you. You're a son and you're a daughter of God. And when you start hearing that message instead of the message of your failures and the message of your hurts and the message of your pain, you start believing it. And you start realizing I can live like a child of God. I can live triumphantly. I can live as an overcomer. And that's who God is calling you to live as today. Can I get an amen? Come on, do me a favor and stand to your feet all over this house. Here's what I want us to do. As we get ready to sing this song one more time, or this, sing this song through, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I want you to realize you're no longer a slave to fear. You're no longer a slave to guilt. You're no longer a slave to anger. You're no longer a slave to shame. You're no longer a slave to anything. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've surrendered to Him, You've been made free by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been made free today, free in Jesus' name. Somebody shout free. Somebody say, I'm free in Jesus' name. If you're here today, you say, you know what? I want that freedom. 
I need that freedom today. I want you to step out and just come and join me right down here. Regardless of what it is, come on. Just step out. Come on. Come on. If you need to grab somebody by the hand, take them by the hand. Come on. There are dozens all over this place right now that need to be in this altar. Come on. Step on. Come 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 on, come on, come on. Just stand right up here. Prayer partners, come and join me. Come on, while they're coming, do me a favor. Look at somebody and say, do you need to go down? I'll go with you. Just, do you need to go down? I'll go with you. Come on, we're going to break the stronghold of shame. Some of you are still letting that stronghold hold you back and hold you right there. Break through it. Deal with it. Face it. And say, I'm no longer you're going to be a slave to my fears no longer anymore get out and come and join me down here just grab somebody by the hand and come on now as we're praying for those prayer partners I need all my prayer partners to come and help me down here and pray for those who are here would you do me a favor just lift your hands up right now to the Lord begin to sing it out I'm a child of God I'm no longer Thank you, Jesus. If I have some more prayer partners in here, go ahead. Come on up here and come around on the front. Pray with people, will you? Thank you, Jesus. Turn around, pray for them up there. Tim. Do me a favor, just grab somebody by the hand next to you right now, all across the sanctuary. Just grab somebody by the hand. Maybe somebody next to you. Still under the lie, the perception of shame, of fear, of guilt, of anger. I want us to pray for one another right now. I want us to break it in the name of Jesus. Father, all over this room, as we as the body of Christ, family of God, we stand together. We pray for one another on our left and on our right. And we declare today that every amount of fear, anger, guilt, shame, disappointment, embarrassment is broken today in the name of Jesus. You split the sea and made it possible for us to walk right out of that shame and into freedom in Jesus' name. So we declare that it's done. We declare that we're free. We declare that we're new. We leave the old in the past. We step out into everything new that you have in store for us. I thank you that a new day is dawning. New hope is rising. Everything changes today because of what you've done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm no longer defined by mistakes. I'm no longer defined by my past. It's under the blood of Jesus. Those chains have been broken by the powerful name of Jesus. 
And I receive it today. I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You believe it? I said, do you believe it? Amen. Y'all can continue to stay right here just as long as you desire. Stay down here in the altar as long as you want. Danny's going to come up here and he's going to dismiss us and speak a blessing over us. Starla and I are going to make our way right out to the foyer. and uh, We've got copies of Better Marriage available if you would like a copy. Uh, but I encourage you to follow us on this journey as we help people find uh, a better life. Not just marriage, but a better life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Danny, come on. That was a good word, right? Come on. Embrace the shame. Now let's walk it out. Amen? Amen. Hey, just got a couple quick announcements before we head out. Remember, Hawaiian Falls tickets are available. Uh, you don't want to miss this event. It's going to be an incredible time for the entire family. If you want to get baptized, you just got to sign up online. You can pick up your tickets in the lobby or online. Um, Teen Challenge banquet tickets are available. The Teen Challenge banquet is July 28th. You can pick up your tickets at the help desk as well. Uh, we got our worship auditions coming up, the quarterly auditions. That is July 30th. If you play an instrument, if you sing, we would love to have you on the team. So just, you can contact Jacob, show up for the auditions. Uh, we'd love to have you on the team. So Honduras Coffee, I know you heard about it. $10 a bag. It's, okay, the cool thing about this coffee, it was the second best rated coffee in the world. It's not just any bag of coffee. This is good stuff. So pick up your bag today. We got plenty out there. And if you have any more questions about what's going on, you can go to the help desk or check it out online or on the app. Hey, we love you guys. Thank you guys for being here. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you and his face shine upon you and give you great, great peace. God bless you, Freedom Church. <laughs>